Hi everyone, I'm Eric. And I'm Christopher. And we're Grow For Me 5V. Today, we're gonna reflect on 2023 in the garden. Well, I guess the best place to start 2023 is in January. There it is. And uh, we're in upstate New York, zone 5B, right on the line of 6A. It's very, I mean, very close. They're literally like less than a mile away. So <laughs> I think we're pretty safe to be like a 5B, 6A. Yeah. But we'll stick with 5B because we love it. Um, but yeah, so let's start in January. We're in upstate New York, so it gets super snowy. Yeah, super wet, heavy snow and our plan for today is to share with you some images, some video that we have over the years so you can kind of see what our journey looked like through the year. Yeah, we're just reflecting on the garden in 2023. So as you can see, this was our garden in 2023, January. We had the wet, heavy snow, as I said, our redbud tree and birch trees look so beautiful this time of year. So it's really exciting, um, but one of the things that we've made a tradition is when this is happening, we like to go on vacation. Yes, after we make it through the holidays and we are in the depths of winter in upstate New York, we go on vacation. And this past January, we went down south to the Caribbean. Yes. And we went on a little cruise. And on that cruise, um, it had an impact on our garden because uh, they had a yellow leaf hammock on the balcony. And I remember sitting in it every day and thinking to myself, this needs to be in our garden and we need to find a spot. And I promised myself in that moment that we would have a hammock somewhere in our garden. And now we do. Now we do. And we love it. Yes. So January, we don't do much in our garden. Except yeah. appreciate and sometimes avoid. Yes. And look at the winter interest. <laughs> So one of the really amazing things about living in upstate New York and having the four seasons is how quickly they come and go. So as much as January is covered in snow, and not that we don't get snow after January, we certainly do, but things warm up quite dramatically. We start to get those sunny days yeah. where we can head out and start working in the yard again. And not only that, but Christopher starts seeds. Yeah, so I started some of the well, like 10 to 12 week seeds, some of the perennial things, some of the what is it, um, half-hardy, the things that can take a little bit more cold temperatures, mm -hmm. knowing that you know I can get them out a little bit before a final average frost. And where do you start your seeds, Chris? I start them in our basement. A couple of years ago, Eric bought me a plastic greenhouse, the kind that you would put outside temporarily, and we made it a pretty permanent fixture of our basement. And next year, we're going to spend some time in there with you so you can I know. see. We'll walk you through how to set that up. And the reason and the reasons behind why we put a plastic greenhouse yes. in our basement. And I bet you can already figure it out that it has to have something to do with Frederick and Freya. Yes. And it actually it has worked <laughs> so successfully. It's a lot of fun. But yeah, so we started some seeds this year down there and, um, in yep. February and then Eric went outside. Yes. So in February of 2023, this is when I pruned our limelight hydrangea hedge. And so as you can see in these photos here, actually, they might even be videos. Oh, yeah. Um, they get cut back quite a bit. Now, I know Proven Winners recommends by a third, and I absolutely respect that. And I think that is definitely the way we're going to approach it this coming year, because I think I probably pruned them back a little hard, which led to a little bit of flopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a little bit of flopping and other stuff went on with our hydrangeas, but for the most yep, we part... we had the mite issue. Yes. For the most part, when Eric gets in with his pruning, it's so precise and pristine looking that you can forgive a lot of that I stuff. know, but if you look at these videos, it's hard to believe that those tiny stumpy little sticks grew over, grew over the height of the fence. Yeah, well over six feet tall yeah. from those little tiny sticks in the ground. And then... The last thing that really happened in February, it's a short month, not too much going on. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. <laughs> I was on the hunt for fresh flowers for Eric. And I discovered, was it Grace Rose Farm? The one it in California. Grace Rose Farm. That grows the David Austin florist roses. So I bought two different varieties. And they were really, really beautiful. They lasted forever. They're too. gorgeous. I feel like they were really special roses for valentine's day or any time of the year i'd imagine yeah. i mean i don't i don't know how she works but she provided some beautiful roses absolutely yeah so again february a little bit quiet in the garden but we still got some work done <laughs> march 
was a surprisingly mild month for us. And we got a lot done mm. in the garden. Minus one beautiful snowstorm that melted pretty quickly, but. That's true. But the first thing we kind of started to do in March was clean up our roses. Yeah. And start pruning them back. And as you can see in this photo, we started training the generous gardener on our Gothic arch from Gardener Supply. And uh, we do have a link in the description to purchase the Gothic arch so mm -hmm. that you too can install your Gothic arch this spring and plant your climbing roses on it. But we really worked hard on researching the best ways to start training this generous gardener up the trellis. Right. We know that with climbing roses, you get more flower power out of your horizontal canes. And that's where the new growth comes that creates the um, flowers. So the idea of this training is this kind of weaving weaving in and out so that there's more horizontal branching with each cane and i will say i was able to keep up with it for a bit <laughs> but then all of a sudden this thing got so fast and so powerful that we just let it go and it did absolutely beautiful yeah and i think the thing that we have to remind everyone is that these were planted as bare root in June of 2022. So at this point in these photos, they were still in the ground less than a year. Yeah, and they um, grew fast. And we planted them with biotone and we fertilized them with rose tone and uh, they did really well for us. So the generous gardener was definitely a success in our 5B garden, if you're thinking about a climbing rose. And then in March, um, the bulbs start to appear. So we have the blue Scylla coming up, we have the crocus blooming, we start to see the tips of the tulips and the tips of the daffodils. Yeah, and they're so pretty. I love the way that tulips, they they just look like, I don't even know, they look like little red um, crab claws. <laughs> I don't know, they're funny. They do, they do. Um, and we did have another snowstorm in March, and I think here we have some photos of our Japanese white pine just holding that snow perfectly. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, another one of the reasons why having that winter interest is so important. Oh, absolutely. And that some of these um, kind of fun structured plants like that, that have just little tufts of needles, mm -hmm. I think they look the best. And the Japanese white pine is a super slow grower in our area. So I'm mm -hmm. not worried about it outgrowing its space for a very long time. Yeah. I don't even think we'll be here when that, or if that happens. But we, it's also so architectural that we can prune it however we want, and mm -hmm. it'll still look really cool. And of course, in March, the, um, the seedlings are growing down in the greenhouse. So just a couple update photos along the way of what kind of stuff is growing. The sweet peas, I absolutely planted weeks and weeks and I think weeks they too went early too, way too early it's so hard i mean as much we all know that wait to start your seeds and we know it and i'm gonna start them too early anyway because i need green i need the oxygen yeah, in my life just, you lose your patience and yeah so a couple things were growing really beautifully down there i think i had a few things what's it damp dampen dampen off Mm -hmm. That's the thing where you get the little fungus and it kills off your seedlings. Can't remember which things it happened to, but we weren't keeping as good of records at that point. So I'm uh, interested to see this year what the journey of seeds starting is going to be like. And this brings us to April. And here's a photo of our backyard in April. As you can see, it looks pretty sparse. <laughs> yeah, but the grass was starting to green up a little bit. Yeah, we still have our boxwoods and uh, our juniper and stuff we can see in this photo. But then I remember I was on a hunt for a fountain. I was, he was talking about a fountain the entire winter. It, I was, and we looked at numerous fountains and we found a fountain we really liked at a local garden center and we were ready to purchase it and they discovered there was a giant crack in the base oh right that's what happened with yeah that. and so we didn't and i said well what kind of fountain is that i said like, can you order another one and they said no we can't order one unless we do a whole big order and we're not going to do a big order this year and we had a we went on a big fountain hunt and then finally i found one online and I'm pretty sure we can link it below. At yeah. least a source, or mm -hmm. it's a Campania International fountain called Katarina. And I found it 
I think I just Googled the name of it and found the most affordable, which at the time was Hay Needle. Yep. And Hay Needle got bought by Walmart. So we can't find the link to it anymore. And uh, then it came in the mail, not in the mail. It did not come in the mail. Yeah, yeah. It was delivered yeah. by truck on a pallet in this humongous cardboard box and stuffed with tons. Is it sisal? Sisal or like a hay kind of fiber. But what was so funny about the box is I couldn't park in the garage for weeks until we got all the pieces out. The box was what? Six by six by six. It was tremendous. And there was so much stuffing in it, which I appreciate because that obviously protected the pieces. I am proud of myself because I took it apart and I put the pound together by myself. Yes. Because I was so anxious to get it set up before the um, catmint and stuff where we had planned to put it started growing too big. So I think we have some pictures of the fountain being put together. Yep. And I will say that the hardest part is, was getting the base level. Yeah. And what I did was I dug out a square in the earth and then I had put sand and gravel down and kind of tamped it. And then I put just, I think the base was Raya. Raya. <laughs> Unusual behavior. Um, I think the base was 16 by 16 and yeah. I happened to be at one of the big box stores and bought a 16 by 16 paver. And so I leveled that paver and then I could just build the fountain on top of it, which is what I did. That was so excited. I was so excited when I found one. Yeah. And it's hard to believe we only put it in this April. I know. Because I feel like it's always been there and I feel like it belongs there. And if you are debating a fountain. Get it. Just do it. They, for us in our garden, they're very low maintenance. Just like a clean out every couple of months. A little bit of the anti-algae drops in there, mm -hmm. um, which are safe for wildlife. Not safe for fish, but we don't keep fish in our fountain. Um, and we do have a video about cleaning out the fountain. Yeah, that was funny. So fountain, one of my favorite moments of 2023. Yes. And then I started more seeds, of course, because now we're getting into the, the less... Um, less time to plant out in the garden seedlings. So I started some vegetables in the new Proven Winners mini seed starting eco pots, mm -hmm. which were good. They worked really well. I would say it was a success. You were able, you don't have to take them out of the actual pot. You pot the entire little pot in the ground and they broke down for the most part. The roots came out of the bottom of them, especially giant tomato plants. They were perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. um, here you can see what happens when we have to start hardening seeds off. We have these rolling racks that we use for storage in the garage. I empty one off and just start wheeling this in and out every night. Yep, it goes out in the morning, rolls yeah. back into the garage in the evening. Some of our neighbors actually joke with us that we are starting a garden center on our driveway. Yes. I, I mean, I, I do think for the month of April and part of May are driveway does look a little bit like a mini garden center. It does. It gets yeah. ridiculous. So I, it is a little embarrassing because it's not the most attractive thing, but they totally understand. <laughs> they understand. Um, and then also in April, we laid our 20 yards of fresh compost in the garden that we use as mulch. We invited two of our friends. We asked them to come help and they did and we're eternally grateful. And I hope they're on board to help us again this year. We ordered the compost to be delivered mm -hmm. on a truck. The truck came dumped it on our driveway and our friends and us we just wagoned it to the back one of us would dump it the other one would spread it and uh so on and so forth yeah. until it was done it only took us probably six hours to do yeah it was uh it was a process yeah it was a process but well worth it i and love it it actually happened at good timing because the daffodils had all just started to crack yeah i mean look how good it pops it really explodes the color. The yellow looks so pretty. This mix is actually, this is something we bolstered this year when I added more. There's a lot of yellows. And then as the season goes, it starts to um, get a little bit more whites in there. There's a couple that have a little orange tinges to them. So it really does change over the season. I would say we get a, a we have a good couple weeks of a, a wash of different colors mm. in that back garden in the daffodils. And then yes, I did plant some seedlings out in the month of April. What's funny about this photo is if you look to the bottom right of the photo, you can see this bright orange yep. little um, thing. And that is actually um, candy. That's a candy corn. Candy corn spirea that the deer had eaten to the ground. 
And so it's coming back. And by the end of the season, it was full size again. So yeah, yeah, they it, it recovered very nicely. The hellebores bloomed for us. We have hellebores blooming now, though, which is very weird. Yeah, very strange. They're, everything's confused. I will also say, you know, the, the bulbs were beautiful this year. Up on our back hill, we have hundreds of ice follies that were planted before our green giants and everything else on the berm started mm -hmm. getting bigger. So it was beautiful. And now they're a little covered, but that's okay. They're really, really a pretty addition. It's like a secret garden moment. And then towards the end of April, the peach tree started to bloom and the flowers on the peach tree are beautiful. They really are. That's one of the reasons I like having the patio peach, not just for the dark foliage of this bonfire variety we have, mm -hmm. but the flowers are so beautiful. But one thing I will caution is at the end of April is what really contributed to this false sense of security about the average final frost date we were having beautiful spring weather. We, mm -hmm. were, we weren't freezing at that point at all. No, I mean, our average last frost date is the first week of May. And it was so warm in April that everything was blooming a little bit earlier. The oh. redbud tree looking gorgeous. The redbud, that's got to be one of the best things in yep. the spring. If you have an opportunity for a redbud in your yard, I highly recommend a redbud. And right towards the end of April, that's when the tulips came yeah. up. What variety are these? This pink? This it's was like a pink it's, coral combination. It was pink impression. And then what was it? Was it peach impression? I think it was peach something in coral impression. I don't know. We all know Christopher does the bulbs. Yes, I do the bulbs. So what I did is I had a tremendous amount of the pink impression, apricot impression. Okay. That's what it was. Yeah. And so I think the ratio was one to five. So every time that I planted six bulbs, one of them was going to be apricot impression. Eric had asked, instead of doing really big drifts or mass plantings of tulips up in the front of the house, to do bouquets. So it was no less than seven, no more than 11. And I just would group them into little groups. You can see how they just kind of explode out of the little spots there. Mm -hmm. This was really nice. And it's so funny to see that birch tree. The birch tree really did grow quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, it did. So what I think is really going to surprise everybody or impress you is the absolute extreme pace the garden wakes up for us in May. The difference between April and May is extreme for us. That's definitely the biggest change as the season goes along, it really, really explode. Yeah, the days are getting longer. It's getting a little bit warmer. And remember, our final frost date is the first week of May. May. Well, in theory, not this yes. past year. This past year, we thought it was. We had a mm -hmm. really warm spring. We had, as you'll see in these photos, how Things beautiful everything was looking. And then the last week of May, freeze. Not just a frost, like a freeze. Like 25, 27 20. degrees. Yeah. I will re always forever remember this. It's yes. very emotional for me. It was. You were working late. I was. Yes, I was. And I stopped on the way home from work because I get out of work at five. You were getting out of work at eight. And I stopped on the way home at a local garden center called Hewitt's to buy Frost Guard because um, we don't, you know, we don't have tons of extra sheets and blankets. So not, not enough to cover this garden. And um, I bought lots of Frost Guard. There were tons of people online buying Frost Guard because no one was expecting this. No. And uh, I ran around until well after dark um, and covered as much as I could. But we did suffer some losses, which I think we yes. talked about before. Mostly what happened is there's kind of two theories around here. Some people say plant your annuals after Mother's Day. Some people say wait till after Memorial Day. The after Memorial Day crew definitely won this year. I had planted 124 beautiful raspberry cream gomfrina seedlings in the garden. The, so this happened on a Wednesday and that Monday. I had planted them all out. We were in the clear. The nights weren't too cold. We weren't seeing these wild swings in temperature. Yeah, it wasn't on the forecast at all until like the day before. And I remember people were like, there might be a frost this week. And I was like, no. No. <laughs> um, and we had purchased a ton of annuals. They were all fine. Most of them were either still in the garage or the ones in the containers Eric got to with the frost guard. So I um, have joked that I'm emotionally unprepared to plant gomfrina again. I lost about half the ones that Eric you had. lost more than half of the gomfrina. Well, I lost about half of them and then the rabbits got the other half. Yeah, that's true. It was an emotional year here in the garden. <laughs> gomfrina was not meant to be in our garden. But also in May, 
we decided to extend some of the walking, the three walking path entrances onto the terrace or onto the patio because um, I noticed last year, this this terrace and patio, um, you might not be aware, was installed in 2022. So mm -hmm. we only had it a one season. And I already noticed that I didn't like the way the grass was like growing in. So we decided to take out that grass and extend those walking paths and mm -hmm. those stepping stones. And it's made a tremendous difference yeah. aesthetically and ease of mowing lawn much easier. So that project was done. Mm -hmm. That project got done. We started seeing some perennials in bloom. Yep. Storm cloud Amsonia. Love that Don't one. Don't sleep on it. That's a beautiful one. The Brunnera started to go. GMs were going. I mean, just beautiful things were happening in the garden. The red bud tree is still blooming, both of them. We have, well, now we have three, but at the time of this video, we had a Weeping Ruby Falls and a traditional Eastern red bud, and they're both in bloom. And they stayed in bloom quite a long time. And based on this picture, how, can you imagine how much this thing grew? It did. It grew quite a bit. The really fountain great. was running. Um, we, as you can see in this photo, we leave the foliage up for all of our bulbs so that that foliage can absorb energy from the sun. Mm -hmm. I would love to say that we leave them go all the way to the yellow dieback point, but there, there comes a point about three weeks after you start seeing that messy foliage where neither of us can handle yeah, it. Yeah, I think part of the best way to handle it is to plant them someplace where you know shrubs are going to grow and fill in and cover it, mm -hmm. which happens in some of our spots, but in other spots... You know, I kind of get sick of it after a while and have to take it. But as you can see, the garden is really starting to come alive. There's Veronica blooming. There's the Jacob's Ladder is blooming. The Peachberry uh, peach Ice Coral Bells yes. are like vibrant. And the leaves are now starting to come at the end of the month out on the red bud. The Gold Cone Juniper is just this great chartreuse color in the spring. And it... It comes alive so quickly in May, it's really unbelievable. We also started to plant some of our annuals out in May. We have mm -hmm. the Super Tunia Mini Vista Indigo, and then we had a coral geranium. That was kind of the theme for the terrace, was this purple and coral theme, um, which in the moment I was like very into. And then by the end of the season, I was like, I think next year we'll do something softer. A little softer. The, yeah. the geraniums were beautiful, but they were so punchy that they kind of took away from the rest of the... For sure. The color scheme. But you can see in this photo that those fresh leaves on the peach tree were that great purple color. Mm -hmm. And then underneath it is more mini vista, mini vista super tunia. Am I saying it right? Mini vista super tunia indigo. Yes. I don't mind. It sounds so weird to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's the one. That okay, is it. great. Um, so with those had all been planted out, and this is, of course, before that freeze came. Um, and we did some begonia with asparagus fern and creeping jenny in our shade container. That was really pretty. That was a really pretty spot. Um, I learned a lot about begonia this year. This was our first time kind of using begonia as an annual. And they do not like water. And I am a heavy-handed waterer. Yeah, so they, um, <laughs> they struggled a bit. But once we got that under control, the thing we really learned about begonias this year is they're kind of messy unless they're out in your landscape. So in the hanging baskets where we had the beautiful um, surefire white, mm -hmm. they're a beautiful, beautiful plant, always, always in flower. They're dropping petals all the time. So we were constantly trying to sweep them up so they don't turn into that little like brown glue. That yeah, we, to the I stone. won't do begonias on the terrace again. The Shiloh Splash River Birch looked, I mean, that's such a great tree. The Shiloh Splash River Birch is really pretty. It has a nice variegated foliage on it. Um, and it doesn't get too large at all. It's kind of like a small shrub or a, or a, sorry, a large shrub or a small tree. Um, in the back corner, it's so funny looking back at this because very, well, not very few, but the colorful items in this photo aren't there anymore. They're not. Um, we did remove those salvia. I don't remember what kind they are, but they kind of just bloomed for us in May and then never bloomed again. Mm -hmm. And so we made a couple of changes. We pulled those out and we put in some tough stuff hydrangeas. I also limbed up that birch tree way up. Yeah. So there was more sun coming underneath. I wonder maybe that's I, I don't think that's why the salvia didn't bloom a second bloom, because as you can see, it's not directly under the birch tree, um, but it might have been too wet there for it. I'm not sure. But we also went ahead and planted up our elevated 
garden beds. These were the potatoes. These were the potatoes. It looks like you wouldn't be able to grow potatoes in these beds, but you can grow them. And it was really fun to grow them. Yeah. <laughs> and again, we do have a link in the description below to purchase these beds and purchase the arch that goes over them. They are sold separately and they do have a cool new addition to the arch. They're going to have arch extenders that make the arch itself start, what, 12 inches tall? Yeah, a whole foot taller. So it's going to be even like a more grand thing. We're definitely going to add those on because that would be fun. And then the cafe lights are also sold separately, which you can find that link in our Amazon store. Oh, you know what's going to be funny is we're going to have to take those lights off and restring them. Probably. <laughs> yeah. That was that was a project, getting those cafe lights perfectly spaced. Yeah. Um, but these elevated beds have been great. And we started that they're cedar, and we stained them with an all-natural polyway charcoal stain mm -hmm. from Vermont Natural Coatings. Yep. Yep, that's food-grade safe. Yeah, and they held up beautifully. They've had the stain on them now two, two full, no, two full years. Yeah, two full, yeah, pretty much. And then also at the end of May is when our alliums start blooming. These are not the perennial alliums, these are the bulb alliums. Yeah, the bulb alliums, we've added quite a few more of them in the last year. So there's gonna be a lot more of that. I mean, they're just so much fun. They are so fun and they're always at their peak on my birthday. So June is yeah. our month. June is our month in the garden. For sure. It's when peonies start blooming for us. Yes, the peonies, which I love the peonies. Everyone loves peonies. You don't love peonies. I love peonies. You like peonies. I love peonies for the two weeks we have peonies. There we have I'm them. really happy we have peonies <laughs> for two weeks. I secretly sneak peonies in because, you know, when you buy them, they're most of the time just the little mini clump that takes a couple think years. I you secretly sneak them in. I have secretly snuck some things <laughs> in this garden. There's... I guess we'll see this year. Oh, we will. There's Hopefully a couple. I don't pull them because I think they're weak. Um, so this type of peony is... Sorbet. Sorbet peony. It smells so good. And then I think, what other kinds of peony do we have? Oh, we have Sarah Bernhardt. This particular bouquet, which I ended up bringing in to work, I cut every single flower off this particular little perennial bush, little peony bush. Mm -hmm. And it was tremendous. And it's in the worst possible spot. It was somewhere that had full sun a while ago, but now it's surrounded by the terrace. It's behind the juniper. Yeah, it's definitely like a part shade location and it still performs Yeah, really it well. performs beautifully, but it had flopped completely. So I cut the entire thing down at once and it bloomed for a good week at the salon and everybody would come in and be hit in the face with that perfume yeah. um also our baptisia blooms in june yes the pink lemonade decadence decadence yeah. deluxe decadence deluxe pink lemonade mm -hmm. <laughs> these names get very complicated as they come out with new varieties this one's so great it's covered in pollinators the color changes slowly as they come out yellow and the pink comes mm -hmm. up by the end of the season, they turn into these little black seed heads and you can kind of rattle them, which is fun. Yeah, so we have a drift of five of those in our back corner. Which you wouldn't believe it's five. It looks like it's 20. They're so dense now. Yeah, when they say how wide they get, they really do they get really do. wide pretty quickly. I feel like they double in size every season. Every season, yeah. But I would say in they've been there a while, but they really are truly four feet in diameter now. Yeah, for sure. Um, we also have clematis start to bloom in yep. June. The this, earlier ones. Yeah, this is an odd color choice for our garden, but it really pops where it is next to the chartreuse of the Winecraft gold. Yes, and it's another spot that eventually is going to become a little bit more shady, so it won't be the perfect spot for it. Is this one called Rudel? Rudel. 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 <laughs> it's got a, a, you know, it's got two dots over the yeah. U. And then roses start in yeah. June, which, I mean... June is the month for roses in our garden. And so these this is just a variety of different types that we have. This is our crown princess margareta or margarita. Gertrude Jekyll. That's oh, another one with perfume. Yes. Lots of thorns fell on Gertrude Jekyll. The ancient. They're so pretty. Oh, no. That's Eustacia. Is that Eustacia? That's Eustacia Vi. And then. That's the, Ancient Mariner. Yes. The Ancient Mariner. It's funny because with all of these you know, beautiful variations of color and texture. Mm -hmm. The Ancient Mariner, there's something about it. It's the most romantic, perfect rose. It's almost like a Sarah Bernhardt peony. peony. Just in that way of 
there's something about it that makes it perfect. It's like the perfect rose. And it bloomed a ton for us. There was just almost never a time where it wasn't in flower. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know about you, but there's so many like David Austin rose names that you hear thrown about, like Carding Mill and Vanessa Bell and all of these like great choices. Mm -hmm. They're all beautiful choices. And you never hear the Ancient Mariner name tossed around as one of the top performers. But for us, I think it yeah. was absolutely one of our top performers in it's, the garden. What's something about it that's so great where we have it, it has it free reign. It can go, it can get wild if it wanted to. You know, we tame it down, but it doesn't get wild. It grows in this beautiful vase shape. It's nice and spread. So it just looks like a, I don't know, it's a well-behaved Perfect rose. That's beautiful. Another one that I love that can be described exactly the same way as the Ancient mm -hmm. Mariner, except it's a creamy yellow, is Vanessa Bell. Yep. And this photo of Vanessa Bell to me is like a stunning photo. Yeah. This was a year where, mm -hmm. you know, partial, I mean, it's skill, but we also had upgraded our phones. And so the cameras are <laughs> so much more like Eric is so incredible with taking the photos, but now like the crispness that he can it, get. Yeah, you know, they're great. We do all of our video and photos on our iPhones. Yeah, Vanessa Bell, definitely the most floriferous. I love that word. Look, yes. Floriferous. Um, and we have that up in the front under the tricolor beach. And the four of those roses are just powerhouses. Mm -hmm. Great fragrance too. Uh, this photo of our containers looks so adorable. They're like kind of at their perfect. I think they're yeah. at their perfect moment where they're just, you know, puffy and filled in enough and still separated, but also they look like they were settling in. Yeah, they're starting to meander and kind of get acquainted yeah. with each other. You can see under the bonfire peach is the pink cashmere superbina and mini Vista indigo. And then to the right of that is the rock and deep purple salvia. Mm -hmm and more super junior super junior mini vista indigo and the coral geraniums and then down front is super junior mini vista sweet sangria yes. which for me was my top annual of the year but i heard that it's being um held back held back until 2025 which is okay yeah like i think it's worth the wait because it's it worth the wait it was beautiful, beautiful color and then you can see here are some updated photos of after we extended those walking paths onto the patio and then um we had to add more compost to those corners but i really it was a great great addition it was the the mowing the and it's funny you can see the difference in the color of the stone they're already almost i guess you would say bleached out yeah so yeah the sun bleaches out the stones and, and i like them better when they have lightened up yes i do so. too um, but yeah, look at this photo of kind of the west side of the patio and how much has filled in. That catmint blooming all throughout the garden really ties the space together. The Parkland Pillar Birch looks spectacular. Yes, here's a great photo of how catmint all throughout the garden in June. Amazing. Yeah, it's such a wonderful perennial. It's tough as nails. When you want more of it, you just rip it in half. Yes, it's very just... affordable because you just cut in half. Um, this variety is Walker's Low, um, but there are a lot of good varieties to choose mm -hmm. from. And Walker's Low does not mean that it's a low growing catmint. It's just named after the garden, Walker's Low. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah. Learn something new. Learn something new. Um, here's a picture of our back berm. That dark purple of the Columnar Beach looks amazing. It really does. It really stands out. And it's just so funny to oh look gosh, at this. Look at there's the elderberry before the groundhog decided it was the best tasting thing in the world. Yeah. And it, it's always fun to look back even six months ago, five months, four months. Five, yeah. Four that months elderberry ago. doesn't exist anymore in no. the garden. We pulled it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was pretty there. I mean, I think the foliage added a lot. The Tromnar spruce had a very successful year this year. I love that tiered layered effect. It's a cross between a blue spruce and a Serbian spruce. And so it gets the color from the blue spruce and the structure from the Serbian spruce. And that will get about 10 feet wide, maybe at max. 15. Yeah. I have it planted very specifically in front of the fence. And I actually think it's fine with the fence if we go back and we just prune a little bit if we have to. But it is planted in a way where it could get to its max size. Without... It'll get to the max size. It would be touching the fence, but it wouldn't oh, be yeah. crushing the fence. 
it's hard to see the perspective in the photos. But you can see in front of that, we planted a drift of Supertunia Vista Jazzberry, Jazz which I think is the annual of the year this year, right? Was it this year? This coming year, it's, 2024. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. It's really good. It has, for us, the same performance as Bubblegum. It, mm -hmm. Massive, massively good performer. It's a little cooler. It's like a more of a fuchsia. I enjoyed that color in the garden this year. I did. And it looks really good with blue foliage next to it. Yeah. Uh, we added in these Litchfield urns from Campania this season. We had found them at Wards in the Berkshires. Um, Love that nursery. Yeah. Great it's, nursery. Um, Wards in... Great Barrington. Great Barrington, which is in the Berkshires of Massachusetts. It's like a 45-minute drive for us. Uh, here's a picture of our blue Moffat Juniper, underplanted with the Super Junior Mini Vista Indigo. And I oh, the Violet Night. Violet Night. I wasn't calling it Dark Night, but isn't that one discontinued? I think that's that got re that replaced Violet Night replaced yeah. Dark Night or did Dark yeah. Night replace Violet Night? Violet no, Violet Night's the new one. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> that's a I love that Alyssum as an annual, so beautiful. Yes, and we did leave that blue moth of juniper in there for the winter. Mm -hmm. It's going to get one more season, and then there might be a place. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, take a look at this. With we had filled in the compost and those bare spots, and uh, we got an ornamental rock. To fill that little spot. <laughs> ornamental rock, I like. Right? <laughs> I, yeah. What else would we call it? And it was really funny the day that we put that there. We couldn't figure out how to get it nestled in. That yes, was, yeah. I don't understand the, for me, rocks come from the earth. So I like the look of them coming out of the earth as if they are emerging from the ground. But I know people who like plop the rock and like really prop it up, which I think like it fell from the sky, like right. a meteor. <laughs> and I'm more of a like rock comes from the earth person versus rock came from the sky person. Here's a nice photo of the garden at dusk in June. We had added the um, lights on the Gothic arch. Mm -hmm. And you can see to the left there that the invincible spirit two hydrangeas are just starting yeah. to flower. And that's going to bring us right into the beautiful month of July. Yeah. So July is probably one of our most spectacular months in the garden for us. Absolutely. It was a huge <laughs> month for the garden and it yep. was a huge month for Grow For Me 5 -D. Yeah, for sure. I mean, on Instagram, we hit 10,000 followers, yep. which was really cool. That was very exciting. Yep, we're, we're way past that now. So thank you for following us on Instagram. Very mm -hmm. much appreciated. And also in July, we started our YouTube channel. Yes. Yes. And we had, I remember when we um, decided to do the Grow For Me 5 D Instagram, we kind of reserved the name on all the platforms just in case. And for a number of years, we were like, no YouTube, no YouTube, because it is it is so much work. It's a lot of work. But finally, this July, we had uh We had some inspiration YouTube. we'll talk yeah, about in just we'll get a to second. We'll that in a minute. But look at the garden in July. This picture of the Gothic arch with the Invincible Spirit Hydrangeas in front of it. And you can see the Tromnar spruce behind the arch. This is one of my favorite photos I took this year. A hundred percent. And there's a little Bobo hydrangea underneath on the corner there. It's just absolutely one of my favorites. Yeah. And then moving closer in, you can see that the Tromnar spruce is flanked on both sides by quick fire hydrangeas. So we're starting to see the white blooms there, the open lacy flowers. Um, as we get into middle and end of July is when the panicles really start to take over mm -hmm. from the arborescence hydrangeas. And it's... Uh, Always an exciting thing to see. Mm -hmm. Look at the bottom of the screen. Remember that mealy sage you grew from seed? I grew that from seed. And would you believe we had three or four of them at the end of the year from reseeding themselves? Yeah, those I wouldn't grow again. No. This... The photos looked better on the website than what we actually... Than what actually showed up in the garden. Yeah, those look like a strange weed. <laughs> like, not a, not a cute weed either. Just a, a strange weed. Um, oh, July is when... Uh, sublime invincible sublime hydrangea really started to show off for us we did struggle with some borers in it early in the season mm -hmm. um which is really a totally new phenomenon for us getting borers in an arborescence but apparently it's possible yeah um, we did consult the experts about it so we did treat it um and it bounced back very nicely that color as you'll see because i think i kept i kept including pictures of invincible sublime yeah. for this video it just continues throughout the entire season it's really really nice 
Um, the other thing that was happening in July in the garden was our raised beds took off. This was our first season. Well, we had them the season before, mm -hmm. but we're, we're still learning. We are definitely not the experts on edible gardening. We're not. But I mean... <laughs> it was, we're having a lot of fun with it. That's I think been, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we did get to eat some broccoli. We pretended we were going to eat the cabbage, but we never got around to it. It just looked really pretty growing it. Yeah, it looked better growing than in theory. Mm -hmm. We had a zucchini that we did eat some. Um, there's strawberries in there. There was the artichokes, which, which looked yeah. so like we're ready to eat them. But then they, I was like, I want to see them bloom. And then they were so pretty blooming that I was like, well, well now it's past being edible. So let's let them all bloom. Um, but we had a lot of fun with the elevated beds. And our elevated beds um, are in full sun. Yep. They weren't on drip this year, which I think was a detriment. So this year we have to make sure to hook them up on drip. Yes, that's going to be a lengthy process. That might be um, drip irrigation part three. <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> After I do part two. What's part two going to be? Targeted water beyond your grid. Oh, okay. We made yes. the grid this year. Yep. But now it's now we're going to have to build. That's true. <sighs> it's a lot of work. Um, I would say something that does happen in July is vibrancy. The colors are a little bit more vibrant. Absolutely. Wow. I love this photo. This is another one of my favorite photos because I love this color combination of the Peachberry Ice Coral Bell with the Ever After Veronica with the Winecraft Black Smoke Bush and then that echo of the purple and orange again in the Litchfield yeah. or container. And that is Unplugged So Blue Salvia and Tropical Sunrise Super Bell. Super Bells. Which this picture you can see, you've got leaf texture, mm -hmm. you've got leaf structure, mm -hmm. color contrast, color repetition. Yeah, it's it, this was a really, really great this moment. Is one of my favorite little vignettes. Yes. And then, oh, look, we have a friend joining us so that we can talk about one of the things that happened for us in July is that we started getting to meet some more, more gardeners. So Joshua came over from yeah, Rhode Joshua Island. Gardens. He yeah. was at an event somewhere north of us and then asked if he could stop by and see the garden on his way back home to Rhode Island. And we're like, of course. And it was a really fun visit because he's such an enthusiastic gardener. Like He's a gardener at heart. Yes, he is. So one of the coolest things we got to do in July was uh, fly out to Michigan. We were invited mm -hmm. to an event at Proven Winners College for Shrubs and Walter's Gardens in Michigan. And yes. that was like probably my most favorite thing we did all year. Yeah, it was really an exceptional, amazing, many, many, many adjective kind of trip. Yeah. Um, we flew into Grand Rapids and we had gotten the suggestion to visit the Frederick Meyer Sculpture Garden Park. Spectacular. The coolest place. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I'm I loved this giant horse. What was it called? Like, was the it American called? horse. The American yes. horse. And it is so big. So here's Eric standing underneath the thing. Yep. Um, and there were a couple other sculptures throughout the park that some of them were modern and cool. Some of them were kind of funky. But we really, we just had such an amazing experience that day. But then we drove an hour to Grand Haven, Michigan, mm -hmm. where we got to meet up with some of the most exciting, fun people. So once we got to Grand Rapids. Haven. Grand Haven. <laughs> They're both very grand. They're very grand. Once we got to Grand Haven, um, we were invited to this beautiful restaurant on the beach, yeah. which is the beach of Lake Michigan, but it looks like the ocean. It's really funny. <laughs> Us, co you know, East Coasters, we don't think of the middle of the country as having beautiful beaches. Yeah. I was blown away. Sandy beach, beautiful sea breeze, and everyone in the shops has t-shirts that say Lake Michigan unsalted. Yes. Yeah, that was funny. Um, so we went to this beautiful restaurant and we met all the gardeners from all over the country. And that was mm -hmm. really cool. And the next morning, we got to go to Spring Meadow, which is the source of Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Yes. We went through the research and development section, which was mm -hmm. mind-blowing to see how they actually are creating, breeding, sourcing new plants. That was really cool. And it was 
fascinating to see like what's coming, but also fascinating to see like what's not making the cut. Yeah. Like we would see some things that were absolutely stunning and we'd say, but why isn't that making the cut? And they might be something as simple as it doesn't look good in the can at the nursery yeah. and, and it won't sell. But you know, that, I was really surprised was really cool. at the decision and the research. And we met the breeders of the plants who were so generous with their time and knowledge. After that, that, we got to go through the production facility to see how they take the little tiny cuttings and, you know, pot them up, put them in these massive greenhouses with these giant flood floors. And it was also really funny that the greenhouses are so large they drive around on bicycles mm -hmm. to get around from place to place in them. They are truly that big. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. And then the... And I will say, sorry to interrupt, but everyone we met at Spring Meadow is so nice. Yeah. Like, everyone was really nice. They're just kind people who are excited about plants. And they were excited that we were there because they wanted to share how excited they were and they mm -hmm. could tell we were excited i don't i mean our mouths were on the floor half the time yeah at some of these facilities it was really that exciting it was really cool and then after that we were invited to go to the trial garden for proven winners color choice shrub which is at the owner's home home along the river and uh again so nice greeted at the gate mm -hmm. by the owner of proven winners color choice shrub welcoming us to his garden um, which he tends to himself. Yes, and I will tell you once again, mouths on the floor. It was the most beautiful garden. We were not allowed to photograph everything because some things are being trialed. Mm -hmm. But I think my favorite moment in that garden was seeing the original three Tough Stuff hydrangeas. Yeah, it was spectacular. It was really amazing. And they served us a great dinner on the river. Yes. It was like a uh, seafood boil on the river, which is really cool. We have some great photos yeah. of like Christopher filthy. And... I was covered in the stuff. <laughs> it was, you know, maybe it's the East Coast in me, but uh, everybody was trying to be very genteel about it. And I was like, that's not how you eat this stuff. <laughs> yeah, so we had a lot of fun. Met some great people. I mean, I had met Sky and Bethany, everybody before at a previous event that you mm -hmm. weren't able to attend. Yes. I had gone to by myself. Um, to represent Grow For Me 5V. And I remember we were in that garden and this is, this was one of my favorite moments of the entire year. And I remember we had such cheerleaders. We had Sky from Hamilton House Designs and Jamie from Dig Plant Water Repeat and Bethany from Chicago Gardener and Matthew from Southerners Northern mm -hmm. Gardener. And there was Heather, Here She Grows was there. Morgan from Coffee and Chlorophyll was there. And they were just like, you guys gotta do YouTubes. Like your garden is made for YouTube, you have to do it. And I remember, feeling so shy and not wanting to be vulnerable or being yeah. scared to be in front of the camera because of course no one's like eh, super happy with how they look on camera <laughs> you know those insecurities were raging and um they were just just do it just do it and um i have uh, a video of myself trying to talk into the camera and then they were all like behind the camera like cheering me on and laughing and um, I turned the camera around and caught them all doing it. And it's one of my favorite moments of the entire year that I screenshotted it and made it my um, background on my phone. Yeah. So that every time I look at my phone, I remember that there are people out there that are just always cheering me on because it was such a great moment. It was great friends, lifelong friends, lifelong gardening friends, mm -hmm. which is very special to find people who love the same things you love. We share tips and tricks and talk quite a bit yeah so it's it's very nice and i'm looking forward to next year to see what kind of adventures we all get up to i know that'll be super fun and so that was that moment where we're like okay when we get back we're gonna do youtube we'll let you know how it goes and uh luckily it was a hit and you guys have been so great and so supportive so thank you thank you so we just started our youtube in july of 2023 yeah so from here on out not just pictures but we also might have real video to share as we move into mm -hmm. august so after a super successful July, we went home to host our very first garden tour, our open days with the Garden Conservancy. Yes, and it was cutting it a little bit close. We were a little bit nervous because we got back and we didn't have much time before we were expecting, I think, um, 
fifty something people came. Yeah, it was a, it yeah. was very successful, and we had done a, we've done a whole video on reflecting on the garden show yeah. and how we would highly recommend doing one if presented with the opportunity. We are going to be doing another one in twenty twenty four. Um, that date has been chosen. I believe it's in July in 2024 instead of August. Yeah, so slightly um, different perspective on the garden. Yeah, and so we were so lucky to have friends uh, to come help us that day. And here's just some photos of the setup of registering people and people enjoying the garden tour. There was a big downpour in the middle of the day. Um, Which was kind of hysterical. Oh, it was so funny. It was one of those like real strong rains. We were hot. We had a tent up front with some of the girls from my salon sitting underneath and we were all holding the poles. It was going to take the tent. It yeah. was so and, strong. But the August garden is really cool because our hardy hibiscus are in bloom. So yes. here's a picture of the berry. Awesome. Yeah, they're beautiful. And they really change the character of the garden because it's mm -hmm. we're such a bluey pastel garden. And then all of a sudden we get just bright and yeah. in, more intense. Everything's like bigger and fuller and more yeah. lush in August. Um, and the panicles start. So we start seeing our limelights and our pinky winky. Yeah, and... our vanilla strawberry looks particularly good this year. Mm -hmm. um, and so here is a photo of the limelight hedge. No, yes, there's the limelight hedge behind us. Oh yeah, it was just photo. starting to wake up. I mean, it's just so beautiful. I don't think we'd noticed the mite damage at this point. No, Maybe you didn't. had, but I had. I was in denial. <laughs> <laughs> Something was amiss with the middle of our panicles. I know. And we did, we did address that in our hydrangea, or in our limelight hydrangea video. And uh, the serendipity alliums are in bloom in August. And those are a pollinator magnet. They really are. They I look mean, like they're vibrating almost. They really do. And then also really doing well in August is the Verbena bonariensis. Yes. Just like Catmint is our big, bold color statement that ties the garden together earlier in the season, the Verbena lifts you up another two feet off the ground mm -hmm. with these beautiful floaty clusters of purple. And even though it's not the punchiest color or the, the showiest flower, on mass, it's not just stunning, but it ties the whole garden together. Yeah, it's a must have annual for us. And I'm not sure if I'm going to need to actually start any from seed this year. It does reseed itself quite a bit. So just be aware that it will start popping up in your garden, even not near where you planted it. So yes, very be surprising. ready to pull it. Surprising um, places it will show up. So yeah. I'm not sure if it's from birds or the wind, but it is a very easy to pull out seedling. The, the roots come right up. Yeah. With... And this photo of the Gothic Arch is really telling about how those Invincible Spirit 2 blooms, how they fade. Yeah, they fade to this sort of um, greeny color. Not, yeah. a, not a true chartreuse or similar to the Sublime, but more of a dusty green. And then they will slowly kind of beige out. Yeah. One of the differences between Invincible Spirit 2 and the original Invincible Spirit is that it, when the bloom fades, it doesn't fade to brown. It fades to a green. So they see that as an improvement. Oh, yeah. For Definitely sure. an improvement. So August, again, was another great month in the garden. So September was pretty cool. Yes, this was the month we went hydrangea wild. We did go hydrangea wild in uh, September. We also got invited to Gardener's Supply in Burlington, Vermont. Yes, we went up there. And, and we got to tour the facilities. Yes. We did do a video about that, which is really cool. Keep going. <laughs> so September was really cool uh, for a number of reasons. Yeah. We planted a ton of hydrangeas in September. So many hydrangeas. We got invited to Gardener Supply in Burlington, Vermont, which we were already big fans of. We already go yes. at least twice a year anyway. But this time we were invited um, by the director of marketing. Yep. And we went up there. We did um, a tour with him. He showed us around their corporate headquarters. And they have the two big nurseries there. We which we go to all the time anyway, but we got some little insights into how yes. things go there. And very cool. Yeah, we definitely came home with a car full from that one too. Yes, 100%, including some Invincible Spirit 2s that we added yes. into the front uh, elevation bed. But yeah, it was definitely a big year or big month for hydrangeas. We added in a new for 2024 hydrangea, Tough Stuff Top Fun. Oh yeah, we did a hedge of those. 
we were so inspired by the hydrangeas in the trial gardens in Michigan that we added in our hydrangea room on our east side, which we also have a video about. Yes, we did um, that. But here's some photos of kind of the before where we had it sketched out. Um, we take you through this entire process in the video, so I won't spend too much time on it. But it's just so cool to see transformations. And we had so many great hydrangeas to plant in there. And I cannot wait to see how they come back in the spring. I'm going to be so diligent about spraying deer spray on them so the yeah. deer are not attracted to them. No one's going to want to stand near them, but they're going to be beautiful. I know. <laughs> um, we also went our, did our bulb shopping in yeah. September. So for us, that's a great time for us to pick out our bulbs. We're not too fussy about bulbs. Um, so usually it's whatever's at Costco. Yeah, whatever's at Costco. And that it kind of, it stops me from sitting on websites for hours and hours deciding. It's like, no, let's just pick from what they have at the Costco in front of us. Yeah. Um, our peaches were ready in uh, September. That was cool. Yeah. And I made two peach tartines tarts what was it called crumbles crumbles <laughs> i you know, i thought it was well the recipe started out saying tart something but yes it was a peach crumble and they were pretty good i would not do it ever again because they're much smaller peaches and they are not freestone peaches so i had to sit there a lot of work. and cut tiny tiny little pieces of peach off of those pits um oh well yeah here's a picture of the tromnar spruce with the Artist Blue Ageratum, which we replaced the Mealy Sage with. Yes. Because the Mealy Sage really petered out and we got rid of it. Yeah, it looked terrible. Christopher had grown it from seed anyway. We put in the Artist Blue Ageratum, looked great. The Sedum is blooming. That's just traditional Autumn Joy Sedum. Mm -hmm. And then the Fall in Love Sweetly um, Anemones, also in bloom. So yeah, September, mostly planting. Yeah, it was mo yeah, it was a lot of planting, planting and maintenance in the garden, mm -hmm. doing edges. So October was pretty fun. Yeah, we had another big garden adventure. This oh, time no. we headed south to Charlottesville in Virginia, yep. which is actually about the same distance as the Michigan trip was, mm -hmm. just in a different direction. Yep, we went down there for an event uh, to be reunited with some garden friends and to meet some new garden friends. Yeah, we went down to an event where, it's called The Plant Company, and it's the home of Proven Winners Leaf Joy Collection. Mm. It's their house plants. So we went down there to be introduced to the brand. Um, we spent a little bit of time in their facility. And honestly, one of the really fun things about that trip was it was a lot of bonding, a lot of really good times talking about gardening, talking about all kinds of fun stuff. And yeah, I mean, talking about like, how to do YouTube videos, how do you do this? Just like learning from each other. That was probably the best part of that trip was getting to like share a house um, and, you know, go in the hot tub and have drinks and like, yeah, we you know, a... just chit chat and have fun. And uh, when we came back, we got to see that Colors were officially changing in the woods. In the back of this photo, you can see there's as some red. As quick reds. as our garden wakes up in May, October is it goes the opposite direction. Like, if, you know, earlier in the video, we talked about how May and June, it just explodes. October, good night. Yes. Now like, the Autumn Joy sedums are starting to give that really deep um, ruby tone. We're seeing um, some of the grasses really come into their We're starting own. to rip out annuals because our first frost is the first week of October. And so some of the annuals, super tender ones, they just, mm -hmm. you know, they die after the first frost. And this is also um, the time of year when we start checking out those clearance deals at mm -hmm. the garden center. It is a great time to get end of season sales. And you're going to probably come across one or two garden centers or nurseries that'll like hold out. Um, but go to the ones that put their stuff on sale. Yeah, you know? go to the ones that put the stuff on sale because what's the harm? Try or ask, <laughs> say, are these going on sale anytime soon? Yeah. Or are you willing to, if I buy all five of these, are you willing? You know, I don't, I hate to wheel and deal people because it is their livelihood, but mm -hmm. it's also the end of the season and you're kind of both doing each other a favor. Like yeah. you're taking it off their hands so they don't have to care for it over the winter. Um, and then you're getting a discounted price on it. So I think that's the time where you can go to a garden center and maybe approach someone about a discount. I wouldn't try it any other time of year, but maybe at the end of the season. And then the last thing we did, look, this was on October 31st, yep. was start planting some bulbs. Yeah, planting bulbs. 
October, the garden is just going to bed. I love this photo though. Yeah, this is really nice. You can see some of the big poplar trees in the distance have already lost their leaves. Yep, look at how much that Winecraft Black grew this season. Oh yeah, there you can see it. The fence, the fence is six feet, so that definitely yep. got about nine feet tall. Yeah, and then the blending of the hydrangea room into the rest of the bed. Yeah, that was ooh, love that. that was a project. But this is also <laughs> like you can see the Invincible Spirit 2s are starting to really fade. The grass is looking great, though. Yeah. <laughs> the lawn looked really good this year. This yeah. was a good lawn was a year. Good lawn year. And look how much the generous gardener roses grew from back in March. That photo where it was just like three sticks woven together. The how tall it they reached the top of the trellis. They this did. Year. They didn't touch. They were inches away from touching. Yeah. We could have pulled them, I guess. Yeah, probably. Um, but yeah, it's amazing what looks fresh as it cools down, like the lamium and stuff. Mm -hmm. but yeah, October, and the garden went to sleep. Yes, it did. So we've entered cleanup month, the month of November. <laughs> yeah, November was all about cleaning up, yeah. putting stuff away. Such a bummer, but kind of a well-deserved rest. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, here's just a picture of the limelight hydrangea hedge after we sheared off all the blooms. That was the moment of editing that I am the most proud of this year. <laughs> I'm still learning. I'm trying to get better. Um, editing the videos for us and for you guys to make everything clear and fun. And this was, that was the moment that I said, all right, I got this. Yeah, that was fun. So like here's when they were sheared off and then our cleanup, our after of the cleanup. Yep. We only had to do a little more cleanup one more time after this, just to get as many of the leaves off as possible to mm -hmm. make sure we don't harbor any of those mites. Over yeah. The I mean, for those of you that don't know the context of these two photos, this is a, was a very specific treatment we did to the limelight hedge because of the mites. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't how we would recommend pruning no. limelights. This no, no, is no. just like a deadheading cleanup for the mite situation. But we'll do hydrangea pruning videos in the spring. Um, here is a photo putting away the fountain. And the furniture. The furniture. And, yeah. It's hard to believe that fountain was only installed in April. And now um, it just looks like a funny mushroom for the rest of the season. I know, or a little like <laughs> spaceship that landed. Um, we cleaned out our elevated beds. We are going to remove some of that soil and spread them out a little bit, kind of refresh the soil. We had made a mistake by um, putting some certain type of potting soil in, in one of them, a coir mix or something? Yeah, it was, a, it was, I think we were running low and we picked up a couple yeah. extra bags of something else and it wasn't great. So we're going to scoop yeah. most of that out and then we're going to do some repositioning of the beds. Um, It'll be the same layout. Yeah. Not just for aesthetics, but also because for function. Yeah. Things got big and we couldn't really fit in between them yeah. comfortably. They're just going to kind of be moved over and then spread out. Yeah. It'll look really nice. Yeah. But that was pretty much all that we were doing in November. You know, we had Thanksgiving yeah. stuff going on. So it gets busier. It gets very busy for me at work. So it is a nice time for the garden to be put to bed. Yeah. And we did. This is really, I remember, I think end of October, beginning of November is when that huge like herd of deer came through and went to town. And that, we've always faced like a tiny bit of deer pressure where like maybe one or two deer would come mm -hmm. through and maybe eat a thing. But this end of October, early November, there must have been some herd because <laughs> I went out hungry. one morning and I was like, yeah, it was it was very frustrating, very frustrating. But you know so what? We started using deer spray. They have not done damage to anything that is not going to repair itself or that we can't yeah. prune and adjust. It's part of gardening. Yeah. Look at this picture of the oak leaf hydrangea fall color. It's you know, one of the best fall colors in the garden. Yeah, this is why we grow an oak leaf hydrangea for this moment mm -hmm. for November. So December is sleeping garden time. Yes. Yep. Look at this photo. Our fire bowl is covered up. Our Adirondack chairs are all covered up. We did learn this year, though, to leave the louvers on the top of the pergola open a little bit. Yes. Because last year we had them closed and the snow was so heavy. Yeah, that was a um, that was a frightening day. Yeah, but we, we took care of that. But we learned. Um, we did get sent some caladiums from Proven Winners to make uh, caladium Christmas arrangements. Yeah, those are really cute. I brought them into work and everybody's been loving them. We made an Instagram reel about it. And then we also did some poinsettias in a terrarium to make a cat-proof terrarium. But look at the snow is already back. 
Yep, that was our first snow of the year. Just a little dusting. It was gone by 11 o'clock in the morning that day. Yep. And I don't see any on the forecast right now. So here we are at the very end of the year. We've had one light snow. Um, but that's all. I mean, it's yeah. been uh, a beautiful year in the garden. And we have quite a few plans for the coming year. I know. And having done this now and looking back and, you know, seeing what this January was like and how we had the snowstorm, but then how in February we were already outside again yeah. in the garden. And now it's December. And I'm like, oh, well, it's not that long. We'll get to, you know, we'll be out there again soon. Yeah. It's funny the um, on these really cold days, especially in December, there have been times when I've missed being able to be out there and mm. having things to do, but we're really not that far away from it. Yeah, definitely, for sure. But it's been so much fun looking back at mm -hmm. the garden in 2023. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. It's so hard to believe. We yeah. just started YouTube in July. Yeah. And we've you know, gotten such a great uh, following and such a supportive community, which is amazing. So thank you so much for that. We wish you all a very happy holiday season. Happy holidays. A very happy new year. And we are going to keep posting on Tuesdays. Yep. Tuesday mornings, once a week until probably February or March when yep. we start getting busy again in the garden. And then we'll have stuff to talk about. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you so much. Again, I'm Eric. And I'm Christopher. And we're Grow For Me 5B. Thanks for growing with us. <laughs>